Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, uh, welcome to all of you on this new lecture of the part of this course which we have designed and it is titled as Development Process and Social Movements in India. In this series of lecture, today we will have discussion around the idea of regionalism and federal politics. We all know that India is a vast country. It has diverse geographical terrains. If you look into the geographical map of India from northeast to western India, you will find whole lot of diversities. If on the one side you have hilly states like Meghalaya and Sikkim, on the other hand, on the western front, you will find that you have third, you have deserts in Gujarat and Rajasthan. Similarly, if you go to north India, you have Jammu and Kashmir, where you have Himalayan valleys. On the other hand, if you go to the deep south, you find that the states are having the sea boundaries and that is how the diversity of India can be explored and it is because of this huge diversity within India that you find that whole lot of contestations and debate which goes around the idea of regional identities, regional development and regional aspirations. While keeping in at the back of our mind these all kinds of diversities which India has across its geographies. We also have to understand that how these regional differences or regional aspirations or identities are being accommodated over a long period of time since post-independence. In order to understand this diversity and its accommodation within the political framework of India under the Indian constitution, we also have to understand that how these diversities were perceived during the Indian national movement. Not only this. We also have to highlight that how these differences which were understood in a particular framework before the independence, it got a new slant post-independence under the Nehruvian understanding of development and modernizations. We will also see that how post-Nehru in 1970s and 80s, the regional aspirations took some ugly turns at times and some kind of sub-national identities and aspirations also started emerging. Similarly, we find that in 1980s and 90s onwards, we have certain kinds of regional movements which took shape of secessionist movements and eventually they translated into terrorism in India. We also see that how these diverse responses to the accommodative politics of India through liberal framework has been questioned, challenged and negotiated and renegotiated over a very long period of time. It is through this lecture that we will try to answer a few basic questions. To start with, the very fundamental question one can raise regarding the idea of regional or regionalism and the federal structure of India is to how to balance regional aspirations with national aspirations. Now here it is important to understand that when we talk of regional aspirations, we are actually trying to figure out that what a set of people who live in a particular geographical region of India think or aspire to be in terms of their relationship with the center, in terms of their relationship with the larger framework of idea of one community that is national community or India as a nation. Similarly, when we think or talk about the idea of nations, we always have this understanding that nation is one community which has a few commonalities including shared past, shared cultural practices, shared linguistic practices. If we try to apply these kind of frameworks or characteristics of national identities, then we find 
that there are whole lot of exempt, except, exceptions within this in terms of lots of diversity both in terms of cultural practices, linguistic as well as common historical past. In that context, we have to figure out then how the regional disparities or regional aspirations or regional imbalances or regional diversities are accommodated with the national aspiration of being India as one nation. Similarly, another interesting question to be raised in this context is that whether this whole framework of balancing between the regional and the national needs to be understood within the framework of cooperation between the region and the nation or the center or in terms of contradictions. Can regional aspirations go ahead with the idea of national aspirations? Are they necessarily contradictory in nature? We will try to explore and figure out the answer to this question too. Similarly, another important question to be raised in this context is what constitutes the inherent tensions between the two? Now, this question has an inherent assumption involved and that inherent assumption is that there is some or there are some inherent contradictions within the idea of regional aspirations and the national aspirations. In order to have the broader understanding of this whole framework of regional aspirations, identities and issues with the national aspirations and how these two are accommodated through the Indian constitution and federal structures provided by the Indian constitution, we need to first figure out how India understood this issue and has tried to resolve this issue before the independence and after the independence. During the early years after independence, following the partition and merger of what were native states. Now, we can recall that immediately after the independence, the huge challenge for India was to assure that once the Britishers are going to leave, the rest of the land is intact. And it was under the tremendous pressure which was building across the borders in terms of the demand for new land which emerged in the form of Pakistan. And it was in that context that a few native princely states were also demanding or asking for their separate land. And it was in this context that there was the attempt by the government of India at that point of time to ensure that the geographical entity that is India remains intact. And it was in that context that the post-independence first few years were one of the most challenging years for India in terms of accommodating the regional aspirations or diversities. The native states or the princely states, some of them were too determined to separate their own entities or identities from the national identity of India. If we go into the past, during the British colonial rule, India's provinces and their boundaries seemed incoherent. But the moment we find that India is about to achieve the independence and immediately after that, we find that there was this classification of the Indian territory into three parts in the Indian constitution initially. And those three parts were part A, that is the colonial era provinces, former native states or groups, part B of native states and part C of a third mixed category of smaller territories. And it was a huge challenge for India to have the accommodation of these three, that is part A, part B and part C. We find that during the India's anti-colonial resistance, the Indian National Congress had committed itself to a post-colonial political order of linguistically defined regions. Now, if you go into the past, that is before India's independence, that is before 1947, and you look into this whole diversity in India along the linguistic lines, and the way Congress as the sole political party which was championing the whole social movement and the political movements in India, how that party addressed this issue. The Congress party as an organization which was championing and reflecting the aspirations of the people across India during 1920s and 30s, they had this understanding that India 
needs to be have the provincial boundaries along the linguistic affiliations and thus you find that the political order by the Congress was largely defined along the linguistic regions. As far as back in 1922, it began organizing the branches of the movement not along the colonial structure of presidencies and provinces, but along language lines. If you look into the Congress committees and the way the organization was divided between the national identity or national organization as organization which had its branches in different provinces, then you will find that Congress unlike the British provinces or their administrative divisions of India along different political lines, Congress subscribed to this idea that its organization at the state level or province level will be organized around the linguistic lines and thus Congress committee in those regions where Tamil speaking were there had one unit and it was across the actual provinces of Madras at that point of time. Similar thing happened in case of Marathi speaking people or in case of Bangla speaking people that they had this understanding that wherever those languages are being spoken, the committee of Congress will work on those lines as per people's linguistic choices. In 1928, a committee headed by Motilal Nehru outlined a vision of future polity organized into linguistic states. And thus, it was because of this kind of understanding that India needs to have linguistic divisions of its provinces rather than administrative divisions that in 1928 Motilal Nehru committee headed by Motilal Nehru reported that the future polity needs to be organized into linguistic states. But after independence, the Congress rejected linguistic reorganization despite its previous commitment to it. Now, this is interesting to underline and understand that till the party was involved into the social movement process of understanding the aspirations of people, it was committed to the linguistic aspirations and the linguistic division of India. But the moment it acquired the position of a party which has to now govern the country, then the administrative responsibilities and administrative compulsions got into picture and that is how you find that post independence in Congress changed I its policy and decided to go by the reorganization of the states not on the linguistic lines, but on the administrative lines and the convenience of the administration became more important than the linguistic affiliations. Under the leadership of Jawaharlal Nehru, the post independence Congress party was initially unwilling to bring these identities into decision making process at the center and politicize them. Adne in his writing on linguistic reorganizations of the state in India has argued that in the post independent India, Nehru was not very comfortable now with this idea that the administration takes place along the linguistic affiliations or linguistic identities. Nehru being a modernist was convinced that the state needs to work on the rational principles of administrative regulations rather than necessarily succumbing to the linguistic demands of people and their identities, fearing that it might threaten the unity of the fledgling new nation. And the reason or the idea behind this kind of framework or understanding was very simple that they, Nehru and others were convinced at that point of time that if we will subscribe to the linguistic reorganizations of the state, it may harm the unity of the nation which was already in whole lot of stress at that point of time. This dilemma in post independent India continued for almost 5 to 6 years. Post independent the ambivalent situations among the political leaders including Nehru due to these uncertainties which I have discussed and talked about in the previous slide. And around this idea of reorganization of the state, the fear of the disintegrative consequences were continuously looming over the political leadership in India. They always had this fear 
that if we will start subscribing to or start giving heed to the linguistic demands of the people, there is not going to be end to it. And even at the smaller scale, the linguistic groups will start demanding for separate provinces and eventually it may result into sub-regional aspirations and may also result into the nationalist demand and separate land for different linguistic groups. And it was under the influence of this idea that Congress and eventually the government in the post-independent India initially rejected the idea of linguistic reorganization of the states. The fear of the viability and durability of the monolingual state were the other important reasons behind rejecting this idea. They thought of that the viability and durability of the monolingual state is not necessarily going to take place. And thus, it is important that we need to have reorganizations of the states along the multilingual polity. Nehru supported administrative efficiency and a multicultural and multilingual political order. Now, if you so look into this whole debate, it is quite clear that the debate in the initial years after independence was along this line of whether the organizations of the state should be on the basis of monolingual or one language or along the lines of multiple language, multiple ethnicities or multiple cultural practices. Nehru being a modernist was convinced that the modern nation state should have the provinces which are organized around the multilinguistic practices and multicultural practices and thus everyone sharing and enjoying the fruits of each other's culture under one identity of one state rather than having the homogeneous one language based exclusive identities along the provinces or the states. But if we contrast Nehru's idea with Ambedkar, we find that Ambedkar supported the demand for reorganizations of Indian states on linguistic basis. A Ambedkar's understanding on the same problem or on the same issue was dramatically opposite to Nehru's. Ambedkar was of the opinion that it is very important that the states in India should be organized along the linguistic lines. Ambedkar thought that this arrangement would enhance functioning of democratic polity, equitable survival of all languages as well as expression of regional characteristics. Now, if you look into the arguments which were pushed forward by Ambedkar in favor of linguistic reorganizations of the state in order to balance the regional identities, he was of the opinion that following three things are going to be the basis of linguistic reorganization. One, that it is important that we need to have the linguistic reorganization so that it will enhance the democratic polity. It will give voice to those linguistic groups who think that their languages will be endangered by the dominance of some other languages in a state where multiple languages will be spoken. And thus, those communities which have exclusive languages of their own, they should have separate land, separate uh, provinces. Similarly, the second reason he talked about is the equitable survival of all languages. Ambedkar was convinced that if we will have provinces along the linguistic identities or in linguistic lines, it will give equal opportunity to all the languages to survive in a given circumstances. If we will not do that, it will create lots of problem in terms of the language of the minorities being dominated or being exploited by the those who are speaking a particular language and are large in number or in majority. The third reason he talks about and gave reason to was the expression of regional characteristics. He was of this opinion that it is very important to understand that why the linguistic reorganizations of the state will eventually translate into enhancing the regional aspirations and regional characteristics. The more a region will be known by its language, the more it will have, have the concrete identities of the regions getting manifested 
through its language and through its cultural practices and that will give confidence to those regions and those communities who belong to those regions that they will feel safe within the federal structure of India. The federation was accepted as a useful and working system of government in conflict situations. In addition to what Ambedkar counted as the follow the three reasons I talked about or three basis of linguistic uh, organizations of the state within this whole framework as to why linguistic organizations of the states are important in India in the initial years. Another framework which was provided to accommodate this demand for linguistic states in India was in terms of offering the federal structure or the federation or the federal framework. In the federal framework as we know the division of power takes place at the two tier or two levels of government that is the union and the states or the central and the state. And within this central state relationship, the states are organized around the linguistic lines and the states have due representations in the union or in the center through the parliamentary democratic forms. The argument goes like this, that the federation accepted as a useful and working system of government in conflict situations, issues of separation division of large regions, diverse cultures, etc. related to a federal structure. And thus, if we will have federations or the federal framework along with the linguistic reorganizations of the state, it will deal with the issue of separations, it will deal with the issue of large regions and it will deal with the issue of diverse cultural practices. If we look into the early response to regional aspirations in the Indian context and how the regional aspirations mainly at that point of time in the form of linguistic aspirations were addressed, heard and accommodated, then we find that following are some of the important interesting responses which the Indian government threw through the constitutional frameworks and through the policy decisions. Within the federal framework, so one may consider federal framework as one very important starting point in terms of accommodating the regional aspirations and balance of the country. The interstate boundaries among Indian states since 1950 continuously reorganized and the process is not yet complete. Now this is very important to understand that in the Indian context post 1947, there have been continuous demand for certain kinds of regional balance, there has been continuous demand for certain kinds of regional politics to be heard at the central level. Similarly, the regional aspirations and the demand for addressing some of the historical injustice meant to the certain regions of India that continuously those demands are being accommodated and heard by the center and you find and if you look into the number of states which have been formed in last seven decades, it is testimony to the fact that the Indian constitution is always accommodative when it comes to addressing the regional issues and aspirations. Second important indicator as to how the early response to regional aspirations were met was in the form of western and north Indian states reorganized in 1960s. If you look into the formation of separation of Maharashtra from Gujarat or some of the states formed in North India, for instance, Haryana, Punjab, Himachal, etc., then we find that some of the major states in India in North and West were formed in 1960s precisely to address the issue of regional identities and regional imbalances. Similarly, if you move into the 1970s, you find that the states in Northeast were formed and those were the states which were formed along the ethnic lines at times or along the linguistic lines in the form of Manipur, Nagaland, etc. Again in 80s, there were demands at the regional level and some of those demands were eventually accommodated in 1990s in the form of Uttarakhand, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh when they were created in the decade of 2000. As recent as in 2014, the demand for separate Telangana state from Andhra Pradesh was also accommodated and 
provided. And thus you can see that if you look into the decade wise development along the issues of linguistic reorganizations of the state or meeting the demands of the rest regional aspirations either in the guise of or in the form of issue of growth, economic growth or overall development or along the lines of uh, identities along Adivasis or identities along the ethnic groups, then you find that the Indian state and the Indian constitution has continuously addressed this issue time and again through different accommodative practices including redrawing the boundaries of the provinces. The Indian constitution makes breaking up and creating new states relatively easy. While this might have allowed the accommodation of regionalism in some cases, it also provides incentives for political projects built around alternative regional narratives. Now there are two things important to understand in this last point I have mentioned that while on the one hand Indian constitution makes breaking up and creating new states relatively easy. We know that the, it is very easy as per the constitutional framework provided regarding the redrawing of the boundaries of the provinces or the states in India that it is relatively easier to simp by very simple majority that a new state can be formed or carved out of the existing state. It has two sides to it. On the one hand, through this process, it has accommodated the regionalism, the issue of regionalism and thus created some kind of balance between centers and states. But on the other hand, this easy solutions to the demands of the regional aspirations has also led to certain kinds of incentives for political projects and thus you find that many regional parties have emerged over a period of time with this specific demands that they want to try their hand in political arena or in the electoral politics only on the sole issue of demanding separate states. A classic example of this is the rise of TRS or Telangana Rashtra Samiti in Andhra Pradesh where the particular party has eventually carved its space in the po politics in India through the demand for separate reorganization of the state. If we look into the challenges and accommodation in the post-independent India, we find and it is in continuity of the previous uh, discussion of the slide which we are talking about that in the post-independent Indian federal structure challenged by many linguistic, religious, ethnic, regional, cultural and political ideological challenges. Now we have to understand and keep it in front of us that if you look into the federal structure of post-independent India, it was never smooth and not more so during the initial years of the independence. It was always had the challenge of linguistic identities, it had the challenges of religious diversities and thus you find the demand for Pakistan or eventually in 1980s the demand for Khalistan in Punjab or in 1960s the subnationalism of Tamil speaking people in Tamil Nadu and that is how you find that India and the Indian federal structure has always felt the stress of demand or meeting the demand of the regional identities. Similarly, the ethnic diversities and the ethnic demand in the northeast has also time and again put forward the challenges. The recent violence in Manipur is a case in point. Similarly, the regional aspirations simply in terms of the discourse of development and growth becomes very important to understand that how the regional imbalances or the regional aspirations of the people have been addressed, met or discussed so far. Similarly, the cultural differences as well as political ideological challenges have also shaped the identity and the regional politics of India so far. In order to overcome these challenges, as we have already discussed whole lot of arrangements which India initially uh, took in order to ensure uh, that these issues are addressed. Even during the Indian Constituent Assembly debate in 1948, Dar Commission was formed and Dar Commission had the specific task of dealing with 
identifying and addressing the issue of regional identities and aspirations in the line of the linguistic, religious, ethnic, regional or cultural diversity. This committee was followed by Jawaharlal Nehru, Vallabhai Patel, Patavi Sitaramaya committee, in short it is called JVPC committee to reorganize the states and it was this committee which eventually sanctioned the possibility of reorganizations of the states along the linguistic lines in order to balance the regional aspirations. Both the committees expressed concerns regarding the new forms of inequalities and hierarchies based on the disproportionate spread of linguistic majority and minority groups in the reorganized provinces. Now, it is important to understand and as the work of Sarangi and Pai have highlighted it that the problem of linguistic majority and linguistic minorities and their spread uneven spread across the boundaries created lots of problem for the regional identities and the unity of India and that identification eventually led to the planning for reorganizations of the state in 1956. Eventually the state reorganization committee was formed in 1953 the state reorganization committee that is called SRC was established to look after the issue of reorganization of the states. It recommended some basic principles of reorganizing the states. Now here it is important to underline that what were the basis of reorganizations of the state because the understanding of the basis of reorganization of the state in 1950s will give us some clue as to what was there at the back of the mind of the political leaders or the political class at that point of time in terms of understanding the issue of region and regionalism. Why I am saying so? There is a reason behind it as that is that if you look into the politics of regional and regional imbalance and accommodating the voices of the regions in 1950s and 60s, they were largely around the issue of language or identities in terms of culture, ethnicity, etc. But post 1960s, more so in 1980s and 90s, you find that the issue of regional imbalance and regional identities and aspirations took different shapes. Now, either the issue of religion or the issue of economic imbalance or development came into the center in terms of discussing and dealing with region. We will talk about that regional aspirations in terms of development and economic growth in detail in a while. Let us have first the understanding of the basis of the reason as to why reorganization should take place in 1950s under the SRC or State Reorganizations Committee. Some of the basic principles which were laid down were following. One, preservation and strengthening of unity and security of India. Second, linguistic and cultural homogeneity. Third, financial and administrative efficiencies. Four, the successful working of the five-year plan. Now, if you look into all the four regions as to the basic principles of reorganization of the states, the very first one indicates that what was the concern of the modern Indian state in 1950s when they tried to figure out the basic principles of reorganizations of the state. The fundamental challenge at that point of time was that it is to be the preservation and strengthening of unity and security of India which needs to be the of topmost importance rather than the linguistic aspirations or regional aspirations. From there linguistic and cultural homogeneity again the, the whole attempt to demand and to create a nation where the shared cultural practices are to be highlighted became something of more importance than the regional diversities. The third important aspect of the principle of reorganization of the state was the financial and administrative efficiencies and fourth the successful working of the five years plans. Now if you look into these four reasons the three the first, third and fourth they these three together constitute the modern project of organizing the states. It is only the second that linguistic and cultural homogeneity which comes into picture in terms of weighing that 
why it is important to have linguistic reorganizations of the state or cultural identities of some importance in comparison to the modern framework of administration, economic planning or security and unity of country as the basis of organizing the states. If we look into the regional movements as to what constitutes the regional movement and why and how they became important, it first and foremost thing is to understand that what does it mean, what do you mean by the idea of regional movement and how eventually they translate into the demand for either the separate province or at times sub-regions or at times separate nations. The movements for restructuring power relations among administrative units in an area within one or more states are also regional movements as they address regional grievances. Now when we talk of regional movements, it is important to understand that the regional movements can have their location either in one state specifically or they can spread beyond one state and move into two or more states and thus you have certain kind of consensus among the people who are residing in that particular region where those people think that they need to renegotiate their power relationship with the center or with the union or that they want to redraw some kind of new political, economic and social boundaries of their region or their area in which they reside. These movements generally assume three forms. One is what the most standard and we all know and aware of and we have witnessed in the last seven decades that is the statehood movements. So the demand for separate Gujarat in 1960s, the demand for separate Telangana in the decade of 2000. We find there is a commonality and that commonality is that the regional aspirations or regional demands take the form of new statehood. Then you have the autonomy movements and here you find that certain regions within the state have demanded time and again certain kinds of autonomies. Such autonomy movements had their importance in northeast at some point of time and thus the demand for Bodo or demand for autonomous regions in Manipur or for demand of autonomy at various other parts of India were time and again posed and thus we can another see another example of the autonomy movement as reflection of regional demands. The third is what we call as secessionist movements, those movements which decide that their aspirations and their demand cannot be accommodated within the federal structures of Indian constitutions and they want to move away or move out of that arrangement and have their own separate land. The classic example of the successionist movement in 1980s was that of Khalistan movement in Punjab. Some of the illustrations of what I have discussed in the previous slide was in the form of the demands for separate state in 1960s and 70s which I am going to discuss in brief. In order to understand those demands of separate states in 1960s and 70s, one also need to underline that what were the reasons as to separate states were demanded in 60s and 70s in India. One of the major reasons was of the economic backwardness and as I have already mentioned that gradually you will find that after 1950s, more so after 1960s, that 70s and 80s, you have this demand for separate statehood largely on the basis of the economic backwardness or regional imbalance along the notion of development. Also, for becoming sub-regions within larger states, there were another demands and those were the demands within the states that certain portion or part of them wanted to have separate identity within the state boundaries. For instance, Bodo movements arose to make Bodo as the language of education and to enhance economic development but within the state boundaries of Assam. The movement for separation of Hyderabad Karnataka region in Karnataka was due to its cultural distinctiveness and economic neglect over a period of time. Similarly, in West Bengal, the Nepalese have been demanding a separate state of Gorkhaland due to their cultural distinctiveness and economic marginalization. Again, you will find that there is a commonality between 
the second case example i talked about that is the bodo the example of hyderabad karnataka tension in 1970s and similarly the demand for gorkha land that all three have demands both as coterminus of the cultural distinctiveness as well as the economic marginalizations more than two dozen such demands are there before the indian government at present and this is going on for last more than three decades if we look into the characteristics of the regional demands in india post 1960s and 70s you find that there are certain commonalities and those commonalities are fundamentally different from the basis of the demand for separate regions in 1950s and early 60s if in 1950s and 60s the demands were largely along the linguistic lines post 1960s you find that the issues have diverse basis all these issues give space for more demands to focus on better governance so better governance as one equitable economic growth as second increase in participative political order as third and development at the sub regional level as four basis of demand of regional regional identity or regional balance in indian polity can be underlined similarly based on new state demand several regional and sub regional issues and challenges are also emerging now there are two parts to this one is in terms of the characteristics of regional demands if you look into the characteristic of regional demands in last 3 4 decades you find that the better governance equitable economic growth increasing participative political order and development of sub regional becomes very important on the other side of the story if you look into this demand for new states several regional and sub regional issues and challenges are also emerging over a period of time and those issues are in the form of preservation of forest so ecological issues welfare of tribal communities emergence of new regional elites in this political process where those political elites are now largely championing and fighting for the cause of the regional issues rise of other backward caste in last so many years and increase in the number of regional political parties within a state now this is important to understand here that political parties who are standing for and championing the issues of the regional identities they are growing in large number in last 3 decades or so similarly the new leadership is also emerging through these political parties who are demanding and asking for the fulfillment of the regional aspirations again i'll give you the example of trs or telangana rashtra samiti similarly the regional parties in goa regional parties in north east regional parties in various other parts of india are classic example of or illustrations of the fact that if on the one hand the demand for regional states or regional aspirations are there the impact of those demands are also not confined only to the federal framework but also in terms of their implications for political order too and thus increase in number of political parties increase in number of participations of other backward classes into the political process and the rise of completely new set of political leaderships or no new political elites needs to be also highlighted in the process of regionalism and regional politics in india if we look into the demand for sub regional states we find that as evident from the several demands for smaller states of vidarbha in maharashtra saurashtra in gujarat bodo land in assam kurg in karnataka harit pradesh in uttar pradesh are some of the examples as to how the regional imbalances or the economic depravity in certain regions or the sense of pride or sense of this understanding that certain regions are well off and thus they need to be separated from not so well off regions of their own state so that they can build on their advantage in a more profound manner indian states consists of 
different linguistic, religious and cultural groups existing along with unequal level of regional development within a state. Now, this is important to understand and I will talk about this particular aspect in the next lecture while talking about the regional imbalance and economic planning. Here I just want to highlight that the Indian states consist of different linguistic, religious and cultural groups and we all are aware of the fact. What is important is to understand is that this diversity along linguistic, cultural or religious lines also combines with the economic depravity or economic marginalization and when they both come together, they form certain kind of regional aspirations and eventually translates into a particular kind of politics of regional identities. In certain context, these diversities become the grounds for generation of regional consciousness within a state and I have already discussed, so I will not go into the detail of this point. Those having such consciousness underline that within the existing administrative arrangements, their region is not given fair treatment by the state government, central government and other regions within their states. Now, this, this consciousness which emerges out of the historical depravity of certain regions within the state and their understanding that how that historical depravity translates into their not so advantageous positions in the society within the state that that consciousness translates or builds into political demands. And the framework of their understanding is simple that they want to have the fair treatment by the state government, the central government and the other regions within their own states. The solution to their grievances can be found if their region becomes a separate state from the state in which such region exists. And as we know that if such kind of demands are building up, such regional identities are building up which has the mix of both the cultural practices as well as the economic deprivations or linguistic and economic deprivations, then eventually it translates into this formulation that the solutions to their problem can be addressed through meeting the demand for the separate state. And we can take the example of Jharkhand, we can take the example of Uttarakhand to understand that how or Chhattisgarh to understand that how these issues were first put forward and then addressed eventually by the Indian constitution framework. Statehood movements seek separate state consisting of regions from one or more existing states and we all know that whenever these statehood start taking the shape of demand for separate statehood, eventually they start asking for the piece of uh, the territory which may are carved out of particular state or may be carved out of certain lands or uh, territories from the adjoining states too. And the example regarding this can be taken from the demand for Greater Nida land in Northeast. Similarly, autonomy movements like statehood movements also want administrative autonomy to run their affairs. Unlike the statehood movements, they do not want a separate state of out of an existing state, rather they want autonomy within the existing states. Now, here we can think of the demand for Bundelkhand region having separate autonomous region within the Uttar Pradesh or certain other autonomy movements which are going on in India in terms of demanding their own existence within their own existing state. Successionist movement unlike the statehood or autonomy movements seek to secede from the Union of India and get a sovereign state. It is important to note that while Indian constitution has provisions for creation of separate states and autonomy within the states, it does not permit succession. Going into the reasons for the rise of regionalism in India, we find that grievances in the regions of multiple kinds are the reasons as to why the rise in regionalism can be seen in the context of India. Of course, language, culture, custom, religion and historical factors are some of the basis of demand for regional identities and regionalism in India in the last few decades. Another important factor which I have already discussed and talked about is the level of development. Jones and MacLeod 
in their study found that regionalism and aspirations of regions to independent statehood can be located in the process that some geographers describe as territorializations of political life. It never becomes fully accomplished once and for all, but remains a precarious and deeply contentious outcome of historically specific state and non-state projects. Now, here Jones and MacLeod's argument is that the territorialization of a political life in the form of a particular state or a province is never a complete project. It is always an ongoing project and it is for this reason that you never have the set one solution which can satisfy all the aspirations and thus time and again if a demand is met eventually in following decades you will find that maybe within that the same territory which emerged as a solutions to the problem of their time has now come up with another sets of demand and asking for regions within region and that is how you find that you have multiple regional movements going on simultaneously at any point of time. Regions are relatively permeable, socially constructed, politically mediated and actively performed institutional accomplishments. And it is again very important to understand that how Philo and Parr as cited in Jones and MacLeod argue that regions are always relatively permeable, they are socially constructed and politically mediated and thus there cannot be a fixed identity or a fixed framework of idea of region in any part of the world. The idea of region is always fluid and it gets shaped and reshaped as per the time and context at different points of history. If we look into the role of political parties in regional movements, we find that the response of political parties have been informed by political expediency and they have been shaped by political contexts and thus if we try to establish any kind of link between the political parties and regionalism or regional demands we find that there is certain kind of framework within which these political parties work when it comes to demand for regional aspirations. Those nationalist parties which are more inclined towards their aspirations to be known as national parties they not necessarily adhere to or hear the demands for regional aspirations. But on the other hand, those small political outfits who are trying to figure out their, their future in the political arena, they may very forcefully back the demand for the regional aspirations. At times, they start their political career in terms of initiating the demand for regional aspirations. Generally movements for statehood become more frequent and intense in the times of elections, political competitions and factionalism within the party. And this is a classic example as to how you see that the demand for regional separations or demand for fulfillment of regional identities or statehood gains currency during the elections and it becomes very intense in the times of elections, political competitions and factionalism within the parties. The parties have been supportive to such demands when they were in opposition but have been opposed them when in power. Now another interesting aspect is that when those parties are in opposition, they may demand for a separate statehood or separate regional identities but they themselves are in power, they may not necessarily entertain those issues. Similarly. Even the response of the national and local leadership of principal political parties varied depending upon the caste groups which were raising them. So maybe national leadership has different opinion in comparison to the local leadership of the same national political party when it comes to regional issues. Except the movement for creation of Telangana and Jharkhand, demand for other states such as Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand and Harit Pradesh generally lacked popular mobilizations. And now this is interesting that we do not hear much about the Harit Pradesh or the issue of even when the movement for Telangana, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand were going on that the demand for Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand was not very strong on the ground. But it was because of 
certain political compulsions or the choices of certain national political parties at that point of time that the demands for smaller states were met and that's how these states came into picture and if we see minutely we find that those demands were made more by the professional politicians through seminars on the floor of the house and passing resolutions if we go by what paul baras argues regarding regional politics in india and regionalism he argues that the government accepted his statehood demands in certain conditions according to such conditions the demands should be supported in both the state from which the state would be created and the areas where such demands are reached now his understanding is clear that as and when the demands are met they are met basically in those on those conditions where the separation is being met by both or being fulfilled and supported both by those regions which are asking for separate land and those be part of the same state who have to share their part of the uh, land with the other states which is about to be created if we look into the contested regional identities the contested regional narratives include that of bodos in assam while the bodos appear to have settled for compromise in the form of bodo land territorial autonomy the bodo narrative fundamentally challenges the assamese construction of assam thus we find also some types of contradictory phenomena too if we look into the whole demand for the contested bodo land we find that certain kind of compromise is also met in the form of bodo land territorial autonomous councils which not necessarily is settling with the separate state but for certain kind of autonomous region within assam on the other hand metes and nagas have diametrically opposite views about manipur's past present and future and as i have said the recent violence gives us the glimpse of that tension which is going on in india if we look into the reason as to why regional movements as separate nation have not succeeded in india then there is this interesting formulation and it is following that the regional or self determination movement in india are said to have followed an inverse u curve and that is that the heightened mobilization of group identities are followed by negotiations and eventually such movements decline as exhaustion sets in some leaders are repressed others are co-opted and a modicum of genuine power sharing and mutual accommodations between the movement and center state authorities is reached going by sanjeev bariyas this formulations i can draw this picture like that the separate regional movement as separate nation starts like demand for this it reaches its height but after that the exhaustion starts setting in in the leadership the leaderships are repressed and that's how they start movement to start going down and eventually the power sharing is arranged between those who are demanding for separate state and those who are trying to accommodate those voices consensual accommodations of regional voices over a period of time have been accommodated and that's how the regional movements have acquired certain kinds of legitimacy through the accommodations within the constitutional framework with this i'll end my lecture i am sharing su- a few suggested readings with you you may go through it for have the in depth understanding of the topic thank you Thank you.